Welcome to an Icon special edition as once again we make history. Leo Tolstoy once said, music is the shorthand of emotion. I have here not one, not two, but three. Three artists, three musicians, three of the minds behind Falconer Productions and the Funimation English dub score for Dragon Ball Z, which many of you listen to and have very fond memories of. They are all here today, and we're going to talk about that and so much more reunited for the first time in 17 years here at North Lake College in Irving, Texas, right next to Dallas. Hundreds of thousands of people love their music. They bought the albums. They want the music to come back in modern Dragon Ball. But many fans are under the impression that the score was a one-man show and that it was just Bruce. But no, nothing could be further from the truth. This was a team effort, and a big bulk of the music was birthed by these gentlemen right here. I will introduce them in the order that they were brought in to work on Dragon Ball Z. First, you may know him from the band Safety Meeting. You may know him as the man who is the brain behind the signature Vegeta theme, including the Super Saiyan transformation, which, you know, many people call Hell's Bells, a fan favorite among many others. Mike Smith, how are you, sir? Good. How are you doing, Danny? I'm great, man. Secondly, I'd love to introduce the most vocal of the bunch from Morgan Studios. He's worked on movies, video games. You've probably seen his YouTube channel, and I appreciate his help in putting this together. Please welcome Scott Morgan. All right. And then finally, we have in studio in Texas. He's worked on several television shows, produced several albums. The man behind all your favorite Majin Buu saga themes, Forgotten Future himself, Julius Dobosch. What a pleasure it is to speak to you, sir. The pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me. No, thank you. So I want to thank all of you guys for coming together. And um, I want to thank North Lake College for producing this for all of us. They put a lot of work into this. And I'm so overwhelmed at all of this. I really don't know what to say. Um, I want to start with Mike. Yes. All right. I got questions for you, sir. So tell us about you as a young man discovering not only a love and a passion for music, but also when did you realize, hey, you know, I could do this? Golly, that's a good question. Uh, when I was probably five or six years old, uh, one of my neighbors, his name uh, escapes me at the moment, but he started taking piano lessons, and I was sort of competitive with him, you know, and so I took piano lessons, and I was way better than he was. And uh, it, I think that that really got me started. But also, uh, it, was, it was always an escape for me to, to just play the piano and make things up on that on that instrument, um, yeah, it, sort of a, you know, if I was frustrated with something, I'd run to the piano and bang something out. And uh, My parents were nice enough that they never told me to shut up, so I uh, kept going with it. Tell us about how you first met Bruce and how you got brought into Cake Mix Falconer Productions. How did that whole thing start? Well, I, uh, I had been running live sound uh, down in Deep Ellum, which is a section of Dallas where you know, a lot of groovy things happen. And, um, you know, I graduated from college with a music composition degree. And so it just seemed like I needed to find a more regular job than the running sound job was for me. And so I sent out about 150 resumes to just about everybody in the Metroplex that uh, had anything to do with uh, music or music composition, uh, music production. And, uh, and Bruce called me back. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I interviewed with him and, and, and started working with him. Bruce himself has said in the past that, you know, in an interview that he did with Black and Fist, we talked about how they talked about how um, with the music and how he was brought in by Gen Fukunaga at Funimation. He was talking about how it was Funimation's decision, nobody at Cake Mix, to have music, you know, playing constantly during the show at all moments of the show with, without any dead air or anything, which has led to some people, you know, being a little off put by that. Now, if it were up to you, would you have gone with a more conservative approach and only placed music in the right places, I guess you can say, or was the constant music just a product of the time? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, it, I believe that that is correct. I think that Funimation did request that it would be wall to wall music in the, in the show. Um, I mean, from my point of view, uh, 
I had so much fun writing that music that, uh, yeah, I, did, I was glad that it was wall to wall because I wanted to fill every bit of it, you know, it was so much fun, <laughs> right? Now, the, actually, I have a question about the actual sound. In Japan, when the series was produced, they had Kikuchi doing the, the score, the original score, and the original Japanese sound was kind of supposed to be uh, like an old kung fu movie, like a Sergio Leone film also, very old school. Obviously, the, the, the music that you guys put together was, was very different. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. And But as Dragon Ball evolved into the Z portion, the adventure story really did incorporate more science fiction elements. So was it intentional to make the music sound more spacey versus the Leone sound, uh, or, or for lack of a better term? You know, or was it just like, were you told, make this like modern? Were you given any temp tracks or anything from Japan? How did that work? At the time, um, I honestly had never heard the, the Japanese soundtrack. It just wasn't something that was delivered with the shows. And, you know, we received shows and we worked on them. Right? I mean, it was a process. And, uh, and so I was really just not aware of really what the Japanese soundtrack sounded like. I think that what we intended to do was just to make it as kick-ass as possible, you know? Uh, straight from the gut. No, uh, it, I guess what I'm getting at is I think it was less of a, you know, an exercise in, in thought as much as it was an exercise in feeling you know for season three you guys came in um falconer productions began working on season three and obviously you know the shuki levy style uh shuki levy had done seasons one and two then they changed over with season three to falconer productions uh again just like you you mentioned you know earlier totally different direction um did you hear any of that did they give you anything to work with from the start yeah i mean we we heard what was done in the shows before we got it, and uh, I think the instruction was don't do it like this, basically. No, well, it's now, interesting because I mean, the score we're, was, we're talking about the shows know, centered so heavily on synthesizers, and the Japanese used them too. I mean, it, it's how it is, you know, with certain kind of percussion sounds. Was that handed down directly by Bruce? by Funimation, I'm presuming that it was a combination of the two. Like, did he just kind of tell you, uh, again, I, I'm just guessing, I don't know, you have to fill me in on this one. Did he just say, do stuff like this, or like whose idea was to kind of give it that sound? Well, uh, I... <laughs> <laughs> say it. Yeah, I, I think it was, you know, me. I don't think there was any real specific instructions about what it should sound like. It was, uh, you know, here's a scene. Let's just start writing something that we feel like fits. So I guess there wasn't a lot of specific direction about which way to go. We were, there was a lot of freedom to do what we felt like was right in the show. You know, you brought a very interesting composing style to the series. Uh, you know, the Vegeta theme is one of the most played, most fan favorite themes ever. Like I know professional athletes that use that music to this day to get warm, to, you know, to warm up, to get hyped up for games. It's just, right it's a legendary track. All the Vegeta themes, the transformation theme, the Hell's Bells, all of them. Can you take us through like the origin of that theme? Did you just one night like watch the series like you got a tape or something and you said this is what i envisioned for vegeta is that how that worked or was it something in the studio how did that work well i i think that the theme uh evolved you know over time uh, i think that the probably my favorite and we were talking about this a little bit earlier uh is the first time that vegeta uh powers up and becomes a super saiyan uh yeah to, to me that scene it looked like you know, a cold engine, right? That hadn't been started in a while. And that, you know, when you try to get it to turn over, and then it finally lights up, and then, wow, you're off and running, right? So that, that was how I was looking at that scene when that was going on. Uh, but yeah, the, you know, Vegeta theme was one of my favorites to get into. That was definitely the character to be, to beat them all. I mean, there's you know, just he was so the many complicated people that. Thing. I hear all the time from people how much they love that theme. Like they, people well, have even told me that they, <laughs> people even said that that scene, watching it, watching the your version, your jingle, your theme, your score is like their definitive way. Like I even know 
fans who only watch the Japanese version who say that that's the theme that got him hooked on the series. So it's just it's it's pretty it's pretty iconic. Can you tell us about Safety Meeting? Oh sure sure. Uh, so uh, it's a band I've been playing in for a few years. I play keys in it, uh, but it's uh, you know it's me and some friends five. Five of us total, and uh, it's you know just rocking good time. Uh, we have a few videos that you can find on YouTube, and more on the way. And in fact, this is fun. We're playing a show tonight, which is going to be too late, you know, <laughs> for for any of you watching. But Julius and Scott get to come out and see the show, so it's, uh, re the reunion goes great. on. I have a question for Scott, sir. All um, right. Sure, man. Good so, transition. Uh, i got some questions <laughs> for you. So we talked before privately, and you expressed a deep love uh, pretty much of all genres of music. You yourself said you love John Williams. You respect Kikuchi, many legends of the past. What are your earliest memories of hearing music, as a kid, of course, or whatever, that had an impact on you, specifically music from TV or movies? Like, you know, more of that kind of stuff. Oh, gosh, if you go back to the earliest, I'm definitely a John Williams kid. I mean, all the way, uh, watching his movies, even as an infant, my mom uh, still is in horror as she re recounts to me how I was an infant watching in the theater when Jaws was playing no. and uh, there was a head that like floated up or something and the, the whole the whole audience like screams bloody murder and she said I just slept right through it so maybe it had no impact on me but but it's a funny story yeah, you right. know, like even from an infant I'm here I am listening to to John Williams's mu music in the theater and I grew up like listening to I had a cassette of Empire Strikes Back that I listened to over and over and over and over and over. I'd sing along till it till I till my dad had to tell me to shut up, you know, cuz I was singing all these like incidental did you ever go roller skating to the Star Wars themes? I didn't. No. But I did go roller skating to lots of 80s music. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> For my generation, the Dragon Ball was Transformers, and so I grew up, you know, watching the Transformers show and I don't think the the uh, original score for the cartoon show may influence me that much, but when the movie came out, the 86 movie, the real movie, like not this Michael Bay stuff, um, but that huh. horror was, was a really big deal. Like I remember not being sure about it at first, but it, then like it w it warmed up to it and it's become a favorite of mine. And you'll probably hear some similarities if you listen to the Vince Dicola uh, score for the 86 Transformers movie and then you listen to the Faulkner Productions score. There may be some similarities which may or may not be direct but uh but yeah. well i mean that that soundtrack is legendary i mean not just the touch and and the weird al song i, I that's a classic movie man i wish people would check and, and you know what's interesting is there is a connection because that film transformers 86 was animated by toei which yep. did dragon ball so right. there's a connection there that's why it looks so good oh yeah love that movie it's 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 a classic dude i remember mike calling me a nerd for <laughs> yeah yeah i need to go back and check that one out <laughs> that was I, i'm a few years older than scott uh and i think transformers you know were something that i just barely missed when i was you know what i'm saying the kids that were a year younger than me were way into transformers yeah, yeah. but not so much you know kids it. my age right okay yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, had my, I had my daughter singing You Got the Touch, too. Like that, there was a phase where she was all into that Oh yeah. That score, too. Anyway. All right. No, and the thing is that I, I feel that scores, like what you guys did and have done and, and will probably continue to do, is so important because, you know, I feel, you know, films and television, without music, because music is powerful, and you know this even better than me, there's scenes like with music you can convey sadness you can convey happiness without even a word being said i mean the scene that i always bring up you know classic luke skywalker looking at the binary sun if it wasn't for that john williams score like he didn't have to say a word just him looking at the sun with that music was enough to just grab you by the heart and just say this dude is tired of his farm life he wants an adventure not a word had to be said, and it's pretty crazy how powerful it is. Mm -hmm. I love that, that Force theme, it's just, it's great stuff. Yeah. So tell us about that first meeting with Bruce uh, coming in. How did he find you, or how did you find him? So uh, 
I don't know how much detail I get to go into, but um, so like I was I was a student at the University of North Texas, and there was an assistant composer ad placed on our composition board in the school, and so it was funny because like I, I I knew a guy whose name was Tom Faulkner. He worked at a, a, a studio. My bass player uh, was a, was an assistant for him, so we could get time working in the in the studio. My college band was we record there. Uh, so like I just assumed that uh, that that was the same guy I ended up calling Tom, and he's like, no, no, that's a different guy, and and uh, and so it ended up, I actually not hiring. It was kind of funny. So I got to, I got to talk a little bit about that first, and then eventually I finally got in contact with Bruce, and I sent him a CD, and uh, and it took it took a lot of he was busy, so like it took a lot of times of. Like calling back, have you listened to the demos yet? Have you listened to the demos yet? And finally, he just got—I think he was embarrassed about it. Uh, he said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna take 30 minutes, and then I'm gonna call you back, okay?" And so, uh, so after he listened to the, the demos, he's like, "Okay, I think the next step is you come in." So I came in, and and uh, and then after talking a while and showing him scores and whatever, uh, he's like, "Have you, have you ever watched Dragon Ball Z?" And, <laughs> and I was uh, like barely familiar with the name. I was like, I think I may have seen it in passing on TV. I don't know. And he had it playing in the studio. So like after that, he, he had me write a couple of like specific audition pieces, uh, like mostly fight music. Um, and so I, I went back after that and rented some movies and listened to the Ocean score, which actually, um, which I understand now it's kind of a similar deal with Luke, you, Shuki Levy gets credit, but it's actually Ron Wasserman. Ron Wasserman, yeah. Yeah, who, who wrote most of that music. Um, Power Rangers guy wrote a lot of really dark, like, I actually really like a lot of the that score. It's really <laughs> dark and heavy, and <laughs> I'm, I'm that kind of guy, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the angriest, e easily the angriest of the three. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so there were three clips I did, and one of them was kind of basically lifted right from the uh, the Washerman Levy score mm. um, and that was the one Bruce was like I like that oh. and uh, I think at that point he had decided to hire me right so, yeah and the rest is history yeah. so <clears throat> in the credits to Dragon Ball Z um, you're credited as the music editor I wanted to ask you about that uh, I wanted to ask you to take us through sort of the process of working on an episode and what I mean is like did you watch the episode first? Because because the way I'm envisioning it is Funimation sent Cake Mix, you know, tapes of, you know, the episodes, probably not even with the English track yet, maybe just the Japanese episodes or maybe just with no audio. I'm, I'm not really sure. You have to fill me in on that. And then as you watch the episodes, did you come up with the ideas for the themes and then kind of edit them in there? Like, is that how it worked? Like, how did it take us through like just the basic process of working on, on an episode of Dragon Ball Z? So it, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to disagree with Mike a little bit here at one point. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so yeah, we would get a we would get what we called chase tapes in that had that had all of the um it, they were like mostly or kind of finished dialogue English dialogue. Right, on it. right. But sometimes there would be like like a things that were not quite final or things lines would be missing here and there or in, in one case there was a line from Tien where he, instead of saying me too he'd say guys I'm a flaming drag queen <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so it wasn't the final edit necessarily <laughs> yeah right they were trolling yeah yeah there was, but that didn't happen very often that was like maybe one yeah pretty rare and there was always a lot of grunting right? yeah, yeah. there's that the grunts were usually complete that. yeah so quite a bit but of grunting. We would have scripts, and uh, and and they like you think that we changed the music a lot in the show, which we did way too much. Um, <laughs> but if you looked at the scripts that they gave us, there were notes written mm -hmm. from Funimation about what the music should sound yeah. like, and it was like every. They gave us scripts. Yes. What? And they had uh, notes, copious notes. Of now I find what out. This music <laughs> was supposed to sound like moment by moment by moment by moment, and it was like impossible to actually try to hit all of that stuff so like like uh, 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 an infamous piece that I did was the uh, crazy macabre circus music I swear to God that was I really don't think I ever saw a funny. script uh, this is news to me <laughs> it really is 
Where, where? Really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, so yeah, yeah, I would watch the show. I would look at the notes, and um, a lot of times I would just. Well, it depended on how long I'd been there. So at first, I spent a lot of time getting to know the library because, like, um, yeah. When I came in, it was a process that was it had already been started, and I had I had to go through the previous episodes and kind of learn all the different pieces. And so I spent mm -hmm. a lot of time searching for music that I thought fit the scene. Right. And, and I and originally I was just a music editor. I spent I don't remember how long, but at least a couple of months. Right. It's just straight music editing. Well, and then we, we might pull you in for, like, give us some guitar chords or something because you're the, you know, easily, hands down, the best guitar player of the bunch, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I didn't start guitar until the Garlic Junior series, but, um, but, yeah, and then once I got familiar with the library and I kind of had my go to pieces established, then I would watch it, and usually pretty quick, I would, like, decide, okay, this feels like this needs this piece of music and then I would go hunting for it. Mm -hmm. Where the heck was that? Or maybe I'd have to go search more and like, oh shoot, this piece isn't long enough or um, or we don't have anything that fits this. Hey Mike, because I hadn't been sanctioned to write anything yet. <laughs> hey Mike, could you write something for this scene? I just don't think I'm going to be able to edit it. Um, right, right. <laughs> so that, yeah, that kind of thing went on for a while until, yeah, the spirit bomb. So Is, was that your first, your foray? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. So the themes were already, I guess, made, and then you just had to go digging for them, correct? Like what to put where? Well, so there, there would be, and you know, forgive me for chiming in here, but uh, you know, as we wrote music, then that would sort of go into the the backlog of available stuff, and and so you don't want to reinvent the wheel every time. So if you want to go back and grab another theme or grab the same theme that you've used before for a character, say, uh, then you can go do that and edit it down to fit that, that scene, right? That, that way uh, you're staying consistent and saving a little time, you know? It's just crazy that they actually gave you scripts. That, so the scripts were like... I don't think they gave us scripts. <laughs> I don't think they gave us scripts. You're right. Yeah. There are no scripts. <laughs> so when it came to coming up with, I guess, you know, a, a theme for a certain character or whatever, you know, would it just kind of just be you guys just together uh, in the studio just kind of brainstorming? Is that like what? My, my real question, I guess, would be what sort of inspired you? Because I'm... I'm I produce content, but I'm not a musician. That's one thing that I I don't have that talent, and you guys certainly do. What sort of like inspires you to come up with a a melody? You know, for for do you have to do you watch the show and like you know just at two in the morning just something hits you? Like what really inspires you? How does how does that creative process work? For me, um, a lot of the time with Dragon Ball in particular, I, I mean I have different ways I do things. Like when I write, I don't always write the same way. I have right. several different processes that I might use. Mm -hmm. But I think for Dragon Ball, most of the time, it was about collecting the sounds that I wanted to use for the, like, like I'll use the PyCon theme as a, as a case in point, because I really did follow this to a T with that one. I, was, I just mm -hmm. went through our synths that we had and looked for every sound that I thought fit that character and just collected them all into like a session and like, okay, and then I would just start to play with those sounds and start to mix things together and yep. like and let the sounds kind of drive the process. That's kind of what I was doing. Is you know I, I think it's very important to write for the instrument that you're writing for. So a lot of times that's the key for me is find the sound that you're using, the instrument that you're playing, and then write for that instrument. Um, and I think that gets results. So that was my method. Uh, for writing most of the music that I did for the show, find the sound, then come hmm. up with the music. And and sometimes Mike? those those sounds would just inspire a particular melody or chord or whatever. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, for me, it was just uh, it, I, I wouldn't say that I had a specific process. It's not something I could define as you know step one, step two. You know, to writing a song, it's kind of just diving in and, and doing it, you know, if that makes any sense, which I guess it really doesn't, but yeah, not, it, there was no defined process, 
just just live it you know <laughs> yeah That's pretty awesome now i have <laughs> i have questions for forgotten future here but I, before we get to that i want to clarify we have to clarify this for for the entire fandom watching i wanted to real quick um kind of get all you guys together here and really um clarify this portion i want to know who did what exactly i have an idea obviously we can't go through every single track because that's going to take us you know five hours but all right correct me if i'm wrong but i know bruce did the dragon ball z main theme the dun 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 dun, that that one that was him and then uh, a lot of the namek Frieza saga stuff, I believe, was also him. And then, if I'm if I'm correct, you know, then Mike came in and he did some stuff. And I guess Mike Mike and Scott worked on Cell, and then Julius came in for Boo. Is that am I right on that, or is there, am I still missing stuff here? Well, I mean, I was there from the from the get go, so from the first episode, uh, which was I guess the Namek Frieza stuff, I was in there working on that. Just to clarify that. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I, I went through, I guess, almost to the end of the Boo Saga. I think you did like midway. Through midway the, through the yeah. Boo Saga. So, you know, Frieza, Namek, or stuff all the way to about halfway through the Boo Saga. Yeah. These guys, go ahead. Like, when did you... First what episode was Frieza Fighting Power 1 million... And then we didn't necessarily do shows in order, but so that was where I started editing. And then the first mu- episode that I wrote music for was, uh, I think, Keep the Chance Alive is one of the Spirit Bomb episodes. So the yep. first, the first yep. music I ever wrote for the show was uh, the sparkly Spirit Bomb music. If yeah. On the track, it's like the second <laughs> half of the track, because that track is actually two, two tracks two parts. together. Yeah. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, that was... The first time any of us had written anything for the Spirit Bomb, so I was really mm-hmm. excited about it. <laughs> yeah, and that was an especially, like, long piece, too, right? I mean, it just went on and on and on, I mean, in a good way, but it was a chance to really build something up, you know? Okay. The first piece I worked on was the um, Space Room. Right. And... That's after Cell. What was the name of that that tournament? The first. Yeah, the the, the other world tournament, yeah. the PyCon saga, I yeah, guess Kevin's you could call tournament. it. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. Bruce, I mean, yeah, Julius was on his way in, and I was on my way out mm-hmm. at that point. Yeah. Yeah, that was the first one I worked on, and then I pretty much carried the rest all the way to the end. Yep. Yeah. Yes, um, Julius. So I want to ask you before Dragon Ball. I want to ask you about this. You were already snowballing and building up your career. You did television in the 90s, a project called Connecting Images, which featured a 130-piece symphonic orchestra. Just crazy work. How was it like to work on that, and would you consider that your launching pad? Yeah, so it was, uh, like you said, it was building a career. So it it was really um, a gradual process, and... Um, I got started quite early on. As a matter of fact, I would say, other than you know playing the piano, um, also very early on. But um, I wanted to be a concert pianist. And then when I was about nine, I started figuring out, you know what, I don't really want to play what others write, because you know I felt like that's cool, but kind of secondary. But there's that person, the composer, right, mm. that could actually write the music for others to play, and that was very uh, tempting. So, so I started composing around 9, 10, um, and got into the game fairly early, early on. I was uh, doing radio commercials, like jingles and music for, for radio. I was like uh, 14, 15, started my little mini like production company, and that was growing nicely. Um, and then um, at the same time, you know, when you're young, you don't necessarily have a very good understanding of the business and what it takes to, uh, to grow, uh, to build a career just writing music because you want to write your own music, not for a spot, not for a client, not for an ad or something like that, but just your own music. So I kind of uh, uh, was wearing these two hats. One, I, I knew that if um, I wanted to achieve something, I had to do all these gigs, but at the same time, I was working on my own music. And uh, back in the 90s, that was still possible to to get sponsors. If you put their logos on your album and you know uh, kind of made different arrangements, how that can be beneficial for them, then they would give you money. So I was really 
trying to get that um, to make happen. And I got um, uh, involved with um, the Connecting Images project, which was Nokia's. Uh, now, mind you, this is mid-90s, actually right after mid-90s when I'm connecting with them. And Nokia was the cell phones, kind of like, you know, insert your favorite uh, smartphone brand of right. today. Um, that, was, uh, that was Nokia in, in Nigeria. So huge company uh, in Europe, this all in Central Europe um, where I lived at the time. So, so basically I, I connected with, with them and that resulted in, in this album that really f kind of featured mostly my kind of music that I really wanted to do. So I saw that there was an opening to, to go that way. So I kind of kept a little business uh, music production uh, company. And then on, this, on the other hand, um, I was uh, doing this album. Then I did another album, a follow up to that with, uh, with the orchestra. And yeah, I mean, obviously, that was fun and very challenging, but, but a lot of fun to, to work with. And at the same time, I got very interested in film scoring, which I also studied on the side. Um, and you know, I thought that expressing emotion is just like what we were talking about earlier, the power of music mm. uh, combined with the power of visuals. That's 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 what I thought that you know that's that's what I want to do. And so I kind of gravitated more towards TV and film, and got involved with those. So it was a, like really a gradual process over I would say ten years, um, and then um, ended up uh, scoring a few features before I came to the U.S. Um, and then the first gig was the, the DBZ gig. Mm. So before you got brought in for Dragon Ball, did Bruce already know who you were based on your previous work? Like he was familiar with it? Yes, to a degree. Um, <clears throat> try to make this story short. Um, it's a very interesting way that we connected. Um, again, this is 98, I believe it was in 98-ish when um, his production company was not only creating music, but also every kind of audio work, right? So, you know, audio production can involve many other things uh, aside from from, uh, from music composition. And uh, so he was doing the, um, Falcon Productions was doing the audio post-production for a short film called Black Strawberries. Um, and that was a short that was, uh, that was made here in, in Dallas with the idea that we go to film festivals, which, which it did. And this is something that I heard and found out later, that there were several composers who really wanted to do um, the music for the short. Um, and um, of course, him being one of them. Um, and it just happened so that in 98, this is way before Facebook, way before social networking, I was in a chat room online. You know, with with the uh, 14k uh, dialogue kind of yeah. thing, you know, like <laughs> trying to wait for the lines to go through, and um, and I just randomly in a film chat, I I bump into uh, this uh, director, and we start talking, um, and it turns out, you know, I've I've been doing like I've been scoring movies, and at that point, I've scored a couple of features, and. Um, uh, she says, "Well, it's really interesting because we're working on on this show, and would you be interested in um, in um, you know maybe working with us?" And I said, "Absolutely, and that would be fantastic." Uh, so she sent over the the script. I put together a little demo, uh, sent it back, and she loved it so much that two days later I was basically hired for that production, um, which obviously felt good, especially later when I found out that there were other composers in the run for it. Um, but I was awarded the that gig. And so that was the connection point that um, the Falconer production still did the audio post-production, which is basically when you take uh, location sound and sound effects and, and dialogue and music and put it all together and mix it together. Um, but in this case, the music was coming from me. So that's basically how we connected. And so he heard my work. He was working with my work uh, before we ever talked. Hmm. OK. Yeah, so he, oh, that's, that's crazy. So he didn't even know. Like, he knew your work before he knew you, sort of. Yes. Yep. In this case, yep. You know, I heard Connecting Images, and it kind of reminded me, it gave me a real, like, Pink Floyd kind of, you know, vibe, Inicio Morricone vibe. It, it almost feels like you're telling a story through the music, like we talked about earlier. Did you want to bring that into DBZ? Like, when he contacted you, did he sort of play, you know, like, 
your predecessor's music like, you know, Mike or Scott and say, okay, can you try to sound like this? Or did he just say, let's bring in your style and mix it with their style and then you have a new style? Like, is that kind of what happened? How did that go? Well, I have to tell you, honestly, um, there was no discussion of, of such, but um, getting into a, a place, of, uh, you know, like kind of where production is happening that's established and, and there are others who are working in a show, uh, you want to adapt. I mean, you don't want to like, try to change the whole thing. Plus, I wasn't in a position to, to, to do that, and I wouldn't want ever to do that. So I tried to be respectful uh, of what was happening before uh, before me and then the music that I heard. And at the same time, uh, you know, if you have a, a musical style and a way of composition, a way of, uh, of thinking about telling a story through music, you can't turn that off. As a film composer, of course, you have to be very adaptable when it comes to emotions and genres and whatnot. Um, but, you know, you have to be respectful of, of, the, of the process and what, what came before you if, if, it's a, if it's a TV show that, that happens from week to week. Um, and so, in a way, I was, um, I, I, I always felt very for fortunate that um, um, very rarely I've, I've, I've been indicated or, or suggested what, what to do. So mm. we, had, we had actual discussions about this when working like, oh, hey, would it be cool to do this? Or what, what are you doing because then I'm doing something else? Or how is it going to connect? Or right. uh, that, that kind of stuff. So that, that was nice, a pretty organic process, I would say. But to answer your question about the storytelling, um, you were asking earlier, uh, Mike and S Scott, what their compositional process is. And you really hit the nail on the head that, to me, it's all about the physical attributes of a character, and especially the story that they bring with it and then about the scene, what is happening in the scene, so kind of how the character's attributes are connected to that, that context that, that we call a scene. And really expressing the story um, through, through music, to me, it's, it's, it's really about the story. Yeah, I mean, you seem like the kind of guy who stays up to like four in the morning just playing around with music. Like, I mean, all you guys well, do, funny. I know that that's just- How, how did you know? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that's what I do tell that with videos. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. The best way I, I can tell you is, that, I mean, this night might not work for anyone, but sleep in really, really late, get up really late, eat late, <laughs> yeah. get energy for for the night, and start working at 8 p.m. and then don't stop until it's until the credit is flowing. That's it. That's the process. Right that's here. the process. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's the, that's the prescription. Yep. So you, you've had a great career, you know, even after Faulkner Productions and before you, you've been around. What I wanted to ask you, what lessons both musically and like life because you were a young guy back then uh obviously you're much wiser now i'm still young oh, but wise oh i know i know you're just smarter <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna ask you what did you learn from working on dragon ball z specifically that i guess you took with you for your career afterward like was there something not necessarily like just life business music anything like what was what did you think was the main thing you took from that experience I would say uh, uh, persistency. Uh, when you're working on a show for years where every week you have to work on the same show, so it's not a question of, okay, you know, maybe you get bored with it or you want to do something else, but it, it's a business, right? So you have to do the next episode, the next episode, and, and it's a gig. And, um, and you don't have the luxury of saying, you know what, uh, that, was, that was cool, I want to switch and explore something else. It just doesn't work like that. Um, and I think I, I carry that with, with myself uh, to new projects, even if, um, even if you don't end up working in a show that lasts for you know, many years, but directors and producers realize that, that you're being that, that um, attitude with you, even in the first episode, or even if just a, uh, just a, um, you know, like a live action feature, if it's something completely different, but if that's how you approach the work, uh, they can feel that they're dealing with a professional. So I think it's, it's it's really um, growing into um, into a, an industry professional that that I took away from it, which is very contradictory what, to what you guys were saying, which I totally um, agree with. That, that the whole process was, you know, we're like we discussed it between us, and and it wasn't like a, a top-down kind of uh, you mm -hmm. know directive, um, but still just knowing that when when your deadline is when you have to get things out of the door. Uh, that's that's actually a different way of composing. I have to tell you, for example, um, if you um, 
if you're working in a show, uh, let's say working in a comedy, like something that's like super funny, and you wake up one day and something horrible happens, uh, not enough to stop working, but, but bad enough that it really ruins your day, and you, sh you show up and you start writing, you can't take that with you. You have to leave that outside. Mm -hmm. um, because then, you know, everyone who watches the, the show, they have to get the right feeling, not your personal feelings. So, and obviously when you're working on a show for years, then that things happen, you know, but good and bad, and uh, that you have to totally separate that from, from what you're doing for work. Yeah. And that's actually something yeah. I wanted to ask you about. I want to ask all you guys about that. One thing that a lot of the fans don't understand or they don't know about is that the, when Dragon Ball Z was first being produced, there were time constraints. This this thing had to get done quickly and out the door, right? That's a lot of people don't understand that. And so I wanted to ask you guys, you know, were there tracks? I'm sure there were, but do you have any stories of themes, tracks, songs that you really wanted to get into the series, but you never were able to finish or they didn't quite get to where you wanted them to be? I remember hearing that there was a Frieza Spirit Bomb track that I think it was Mike. I, I don't remember exactly. It was years ago that it, it was worked on, but it was never finished and it was really good. Were there moments like that where you were like, you know, damn, like I wish you could have put that in there? I uh, would say more often it was just that uh, we would wind up staying late to finish things. You know, I, I don't feel like we compromised on the quality uh, because of the tight schedule, and it was a tight schedule. Uh, I think we put everything that we had into it every time. And like you were talking about the consistency, there was never a I'm going to phone it in this week kind of thing happening. It was I'm going to do my best every time. And if that, you know, I, I could lose myself in it. So if I'd spend an 18-hour day up there working on stuff that, you know, that was fine. Not that that happened every day. But, <laughs> but yeah, uh, what do you think, guys? I don't know. I think there might have been times. Where were there times where you didn't get out what you wanted to get out? Yeah, cause, I mean, I was really, I, w I was focused on music editing, and I was most of the time, and and, and mm -hmm. I was really cognizant of like how long we'd spent on each episode, and I was I was watching. Well, I also know that. So I was so I would like sacrifice a lot of times. I want to write music for this scene, but I don't think we have time. Well, no, that's that's true. You yeah, know, like, if we could have written, you know new stuff for everything yeah, I, I feel the same way that would have been could've, i would have you know like right like to bring in live players for everything sure sure like yeah awesome yeah quality instruments for you know that would have been of course that's yeah. budget and time for, right you know? but um <laughs> yeah or or like you know i should instead of recording the guitars direct i should have gone into the control room and you know mic'd everything up properly in a good room right. and, and like gotten a lot better guitar sound you know there, there's there's things i think we could have done or find you know better synth patches for certain instruments you know there, i think there's a lot of things we, that could have been better about certain things so uh but yeah at the same time a, a strategy i had was just to to do what i knew worked mm. you know like like if if I had a choice between X and Y, and I knew X was easily and I'd done it before, and then I would just go for that because I knew that, that the time was of essence, and so I'd just do the simple good thing that I knew worked. Huh. And if and if that blew up in my face, that was bad. But usually it didn't. Usually I, I was able to like say, okay, the effective quick thing to do is this. I'm yeah. gonna do that and, and move on. Exactly. That that's why it's. Uh, I don't think it's very usual that you have scraps. Um, after a, a, a sh you work in a show, because uh, if they're tight deadlines, then it might involve experimentation. Um, you try things, but you don't record it. Like you try what works, you play back the scene, and and you play over it, or you know, kind of the um, just testing the waters like a prototype. Mm -hmm. What would this feel like? What would this sound like? But you don't go through production. And when you found something that works, then you have only so much time left. Then you finish writing that. You go through production, and that's that's the stuff that that works. And yep. like pulling something out after it and replacing, just no time for that. Yeah, and I, I should mention, like when I do, like I do a lot of music on, online nowadays. I put up stuff on YouTube or on my personal or on my albums. Do you? Huh? But, but do you really? <laughs> <laughs> I take much longer on those tracks than I did on anything I wrote on, on for the actual show because there I had time 
to experiment and do what I really want to do, you know, I have time to like tweak the mix perfectly and, or, or put in that. And, and, and I have different goals too with that music. You know, like, like I feel it for the freedom to do an, a blazing guitar. Yeah, far fewer solo, constraints solo, to it, right? Which, which I wouldn't do for the show. Like if you listen to my guitar playing for the show, it's much uh, more <laughs> laid back. But, um, Less guitar hero. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so, so yeah. If you had a chance to alter, I guess, the sound of DBZ, what would you have changed in the instrumentation besides, like you said, getting more tweaking and bringing in some more like live instrumentation? Um, you know, what 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 would you have changed? You know, looking back now, like if you had, I guess, if you had more time, I guess would be the right the right question. Who's, who's well, in more gear. You know? I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, so. Anybody, yeah. To me, tex texture of, of sounds is extremely important. Um, you can play one note uh, with a different sound, um, and especially when you're talking about um, electronically generated sounds, um, and you can express a feeling just with one note. So it's not uh, so often it's not even in the music, but it's in the sound, which is Amber. yeah, which is part of electronic music. It's you know it's it's an, it's another element there, and um, and so if there was more time to really cook up the sounds that even by themselves they're thick and full and, and really um, amazing and then you put many of those together well that's a really strong soundtrack but that takes time mm -hmm. so and that's often what we what we didn't have yeah i could tell when i heard you know your non dragon ball stuff it definitely sounds like you you put a lot into it like it was like more heavy which i guess we we're talking about i was gonna ask you julius actually because you know, all you guys have like favorite tracks. What I mean is like fan favorite. You know, um, the one for you would be the Goku Super Saiyan 3 theme and the Earth song. I think that was also the boost side of the Earth song. I was going to ask you uh, when you when you composed that Super Saiyan 3 song or Super Saiyan 3 theme where Sean Shemble's just screaming, you know, all credit to Sean Shemble for, for nailing that scene. It was amazing. Did you get the scene? hear Sean and then come up with it? Or did you get the scene with no dub audio? Like, I know you guys said you had like temp dub audio, but with, specifically for that one, because that's one that everybody loves. Uh, was that one where, you know, you had the audio ahead of time, the, the, the vocals, I mean, from him of him screaming? Or was it something that maybe he screamed after he heard your track? How did that work? <laughs> Honestly, I don't remember, but I would be willing to almost bet and go with, um, uh, we must have heard it because almost always we had the uh, the uh, the English dub on the uh, on the chase tape. So when you get get the the, the tape, half of it was used for um, for uh, basically technical reasons, uh, so time code and whatnot. And then the other half, uh, you can actually hear the the close to final. I mean, correct? Yeah, I would say like eighty percent final. Eighty yeah. percent. Yeah. Now whether that that was in the twenty percent maybe or the eighty percent, I honestly don't remember. Uh, but probably we did hear that. Yeah. Oh, okay. That, yeah. Great. Well, thank you guys so very much uh, for joining me. It's been a, a tremendous pleasure. I want to thank North Lake College also for putting this together. Uh, yeah. It's I'm never going to forget it. And uh, I want you guys to go ahead. You have the floor. Uh, we'll start with Mike and then Scott and then Julius. If you want to say anything to the the fans of Dragon Ball, who are my main audience, you know, to check out your work that you're working on now, promote anything. Uh, hey, the floor is yours. Uh, Mike, you first, and then we'll go to Scott and Julius, and we'll be out of here. All right. Uh, for me, I'd just say go to safetymeeting.rocks and check out the band. <laughs> yeah, thanks to the fans for all this. But yeah, absolutely. Thanks to the fans. I've it's been awesome. It's been like... <laughs> 10 years now I've been almost 10 years doing this stuff on YouTube and it's been it's been awesome and fun and uh, and and I just put out a new album it's called Legend of the Insane lots of stuff for you guys on the on the a new album so it's on iTunes uh, if it's, I don't know if it's on Amazon yet it'll be there soon uh, yeah so check that out and check out my YouTube and lots of lots of stuff <laughs> anyway yeah. oh let's see I have two things to share one um if you like the electronic elements in your favorite soundtracks, um, then uh, just search for Forgotten Future in Google. Uh, you will find a bunch of things that, uh, that I released and I put out. 
on the Forgotten Future, um, come to the show if, if there's a show near, nearby. Or let me know if you want me to go to you and, and play. If you, if you get enough of your bodies together, then we might be able to make that happen. Uh, the second thing I would say is that um, we've been talking that we've been so um, happy to meet up after all these years, then uh, it's not a guarantee, but we actually started kind of talking about maybe we should do something together, the three of us. Yes. And uh, for me, that would be completely <coughs> different than what I, I do with uh, Forgotten Future, but, um, but we'll see where that goes. Yeah. That's very exciting for the future. I, for the future. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's awesome. I can't wait to hear more. I, I can't wait to talk to you guys more in the future because I have a lot more questions, but we'll save them for another time. But thank you. And thanks once again to North Lake College. Um, we'll leave links to everything in the description of, of this video, uh, not just your work, but also the university. And, you know, I thank all you guys. And I hope you I hope everybody watching this enjoyed it. It was a treat for me and hopefully for you guys as well. And uh, remember to take care of yourself and each other. And I'll talk to you all later. Thank thanks, you, Danny. Thanks, uh...